episode 74. I would like to toast to curiosity, which is what I believe is the single best way to discover the greatest things in life. Oh, I love that. Cheers. Hey, everybody, this is the Just Forking Around podcast, where every week we raise our glass and toast to the beautifully insane, sexy world of food adventures. Expect a variety pack of guests every week. All have the most compelling stories. They are the brewers, the distillers, the authors, winemakers, farmers, vegan product makers, restaurateurs, top chefs, entrepreneurs. I mean, truly inspirational, motivational. This is ear ball riveting. So settle in and let's fork around. Forking around reminds me of my social media platforms that I would love to share with you. <laughs> at Forking Podcast, that is Instagram. So at Forking Podcast, website, justforkingaround.net. And Facebook is my personal page, Debbie.Salzberg. And if you're on the iTunes, enjoying the podcast, I would love, if you enjoyed the show, to subscribe, rate, and review. Much love. And now let's really get into this next episode. Hello, my friends. Welcome back to the listeners, the regulars. Thanks for subscribing on iTunes so you don't miss an episode. And welcome to the new, the new listeners. If this is your first time here, thank you so much for bringing your earballs to the show. I know you have so many choices out there. So I appreciate your ears here. Thank you. And this is a great episode with Shannon O'Donnell. Now, Shannon O'Donnell, I love her story and I love her experience and I love what she contributes. Motivational, inspirational. She's forking awesome. Uh, if you don't know of her yet, so let me just qualify a little bit, give her give a little bio real quick. She is the founder of A Little Adrift, a littleadrift.com. This little, teeny little website that started back in 2008 and has just exploded in growth over the past decade. It's a resource which spans more than 100 countries and tens of thousands of readers. And the members of this community basically have been dreaming of taking a trip around the world or have taken trips around the world. And a little adrift helps people find the courage and the resources to make international travel a reality. And there's some tips and tons of tips and tools in there, not some. I mean, it's it's deep. It's such a good website. Uh, she also authored a book called The Volunteer Traveler's Handbook. Uh, she's authoring another book on its way soon. She also caught the attention and earned the recognition of being National Geographic's Traveler of the Year a few years back. And we recorded this episode. She was in Barcelona and I was in LA. I love how we can do that in the world of 2018. She rooted down in Barcelona for a brief stint. And I'm sure, Shannon, you probably got a little nervous when I said rooted down because she has been just traveling since 2008 all around the world. And I don't mean just like hobnobbing. She gets in there. She volunteers. She finds the little remote villages and communities and really learns and immerses herself in the culture. So that's why I thought what a perfect guest to have to share with us a couple of topics um, we really dive into. One is about connecting to cultures through food. And another part of this narrative, which she's all about is responsible tourism and how you and me and we uh, can travel or participate in ways to build support community, like remote villages. I mean, like the hills in Mexico or, you know, the lands far away in Thailand on how, for example, you know, finding that remote or independently owned mom and pop coffee shop and buying your coffee there 
and really maybe speaking with the owner or the person there and, and learning a little bit about them and the culture and how literally your dollar can be threaded back to the hills of where they harvested and grew and fair trade uh, the coffee beans and how that all works. That's a for-profit business where you can support social enterprise. And there's tons of other ways of doing that as well through volunteer responsibly, through your dollar where you purchasing power. And I say dollar, but I know it's a different currency when you're in different countries. And really food as a portal into culture. So without further ado, please enjoy this episode with Shannon O'Donnell. Okay, Shannon O'Donnell, welcome. How are you? I'm doing really well. Thanks so much for having me. You are awesome. I was um I'm so I'm so happy to dig in with you. Your backstory gets some of your perspective on some food culture and you know some other aspects that we'll dig into. But first, I want to just get right into it and do a toast so we can uh so we can dig into your background. <laughs> let's get, let's do a toast. I'm gonna <laughs> it's early in the morning, Shannon, for me. It's eight in the morning. I'm in oh. Pacific Coast time. I'm on a on the sailboat, and I I, do, I have my little dog with me. We're sitting here, and Aww. I'm drinking a little Starbucks coffee. And I think you're in Barcelona. I am, and so I have um, a Moroccan bean tea. I was in Morocco a few weeks ago, so I've got a, a tea here to toast with. But it's later for me. It's five p.m. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm going to raise my coffee to you, and will you do the honors of the toast, Shannon? Absolutely. I would like to toast to curiosity, which is what I believe is the single best way to discover the greatest things in life. Ah, I love that. Cheers. 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 It seems to have been your mantra for the past 10 years. <laughs> it has been. That's why I wanted to toast to it because it, um, it has informed my travel. So we'll just do a quick little, um, not a quick little, because your background, I mean, we could do a whole episode on each segment of your background, but let's, <laughs> we have a littleadrift.com, which is not just a website, it's more of a resource. We can get into that in a moment. And then 2012, you authored a book called The Volunteer Traveler's Handbook. You also started grassrootsvolunteering.org. And this is like the drum roll. You were the 2013 Traveler of the Year by National Geographic. Which is yeah, that was one of those moments. Like, oh, I had um, always read the magazine growing up, so it was a big moment for me to yeah. get the email from them. That's amazing, so amazing. So, let's talk a little bit about you and what what you're up to with your a little drift dot com. Uh, maybe some other blogging endeavors that you're in. Just a little little background of where you're at. Yeah, absolutely. So a little adrift was in 2008, I was living in Los Angeles and I decided to book a one-way ticket around the world. And so the blog actually started back in 2008. It's hard to imagine, but there weren't a lot of travel resources online. And so I was this single woman. I wanted to go travel. And I also have always had a service background where when I lived in Florida, my hometown, and went to college and in LA, I had always found service projects. And so I wanted to take this trip abroad, document sort of the practical side of planning, but also how I could be of service to different places on the road for that first year. And then the website, actually, that was 10 years ago. So, you know, it's no secret, I guess, that uh, I never stopped traveling. <laughs> <laughs> That's, a, I mean, that, if you think about 10 years ago, Shannon, I mean, so now I say, oh, a blog or a travel resource, but 10 years ago, might as well, seems could, in technology wise and how current we are now, could be like, 80 years, 100 years ago, right? In the sense of not a lot of female travelers uh, documenting and contributing their travel stories online for others to participate in and learn from. Absolutely. I would say that there were about three to five US bloggers that you could find their blogs. Like, you know, Blogger and some of these newer other platforms that were new at the time, they had these smaller blogs, but of people who were out there really sharing what it was like to be curious and explore the world and take one of these trips. And so for me, actually, my voice was also unique because a lot of people were doing what the British call the gap year and they were taking a year out off of their lives. But I have worked the entire time that I've traveled, I have online work that I've done. And so I wanted to see, could I find internet in India? And the answer was, <laughs> it was really difficult. <laughs> I know, because now you can travel. I mean, I was traveling. You can bring like hotspots with you. You know, I mean, there's actually like, there's 
it's it's gotten so a little bit more advanced. Not saying that that hotspot might work in that place in India, but there's there's ways now that you can actually, you know, stay connected. I mean, but gosh, I didn't even think a few years ago trying to find internet in remote areas must have been interesting. <laughs> It, it was. And so it was not, Wi Fi was not what I was looking for. Most of the time I was looking for a grounded connection in India because they just didn't even have Wi Fi. But then, you know, fast forward, it was only, I was in 2014. So six years later, I was in Africa and the middle of Rwanda in a mountain on a lake. And I had a 3G signal that I could hotspot myself to. And I wired in and did a call with one of my clients. And it was like six years had absolutely changed the travel landscape. Oh my God. Even I said 2008, I was thinking Wi Fi. And you're like, there was no Wi Fi. <laughs> it was like, right? It was, that's really <laughs> funny. <laughs> that is so, I'm so used to it now. That's really funny. And then you, you um, authored the book, A Volunteer's mm-hmm. Traveler's Handbook in 2012. So that must have been birthed over your experience while traveling. It was absolutely. And actually, it was birthed from the perspective of, again, in 2008, when you researched places to volunteer, it was these multinational corporations that, you know, they had the resources to have an on the ground connection to have a really nice website based for Westerners. And then so they were the gatekeepers. They're what I call the middleman. And so I authored the Volunteer Traveler's Handbook to sort of show other travelers that you don't have to go through these middlemen who take sometimes 80% of your very hefty volunteering fee and then leave very little behind in Nepal or Cambodia or these places that I ended up traveling. And so the Volunteer Traveler's Handbook was to sort of unmask some of that, but also say that it's so it's funny because I couched it as volunteering, but what I really wanted more people to understand is that my real passion was responsible volunteering and you are responsible travel and you don't have to volunteer to be a responsible traveler. And that's what grassroots volunteering is about. It's two databases where one is volunteering, indie volunteering opportunities with no middlemen. And then the other side of it is a completely separate database with geolocated social enterprises. These are like mom and pop restaurants that happen to, you know, use indigenous mothers or something like that. They have some sort of social mission that they use. And so other travelers have helped me map the world of these tiny businesses that have a social mission that you can go and spend your money on. See, I love that because I would definitely want to get into, you know, supporting social enterprises and for-profit businesses that you have some experience with and strong passion for. Because it's a way that we might, as a traveler, not understand like, wait, I want to do good, quote unquote, for the area that I'm going to, but I don't feel, I don't know if I can volunteer on my vacation. And there's other ways to support. And I think that that is a little bit of what for-profit businesses that one supports. Absolutely. And that's the the heart of it is, you know, I, I often tell people it's not even that you should be looking at volunteering. Like for most people, unless you've got an absolute skill that you have the time to leave behind, a lot of people should feel good about this other side of responsible travel, which is supporting social enterprises instead of the industry saying, oh, like here's a two week trip where you can kind of We're going to design it so you feel good about yourself and call it volunteering. But there's this whole other mindset about travel that's really actually beneficial and we can all feel really good about. (laughs) No, I'm laughing because I know a couple years ago, it was a few years ago, Shannon, I was going to go, I wanted to go travel. I wanted to go do something, quote, good doing for the Mm -hmm. area that I was visiting. So I wasn't, I was trying to find things and it was like, okay, it's it's a very expensive paid, you know, vacation slash, but it's a volunteer vacation. And for some, and there was, there was a lot of them. So I understand what you mean, because it's designed in, in such a way that you, it's, it felt, I don't know, it just didn't resonate with me. And some of them, I felt like it was a little more of a commercial or something. Mm -hmm. I don't know. And I wasn't sure exactly how that was going to pan out. And it was really expensive to me for me to volunteer. (laughs) So (laughs) make a lot of money. (laughs) Yeah. So I ended up doing something called Woofing, World Organization of Organic Farmers. I think they keep changing the the ways that those are. But it's basically a platform where you can go and live, you know, agriturismo in Italy and kind of do a trade. They have a lot in Australia where you work on a farm in exchange Mm -hmm. for room and board um, kind of thing. So... I don't know if you're familiar at all with woofing. <laughs> yeah, I've actually never done it, mostly because I had my, I was always working. So like I didn't, when I was volunteering, you know, like you have to commit certain hours to the woofing, but it always seemed incredible because I've had, you know, other travelers I meet have wonderful experiences and they're embedded in local communities, which is hard of what I'm passionate about is finding a way to be with the locals, you know, and learning from them. Yeah. So that's, I felt 
So when I was when I was learning about you and and your background a little bit, I was like, oh, we're we're totally she's incongruent. Like I love what what you do and what you believe in and and your experiences. I mean, you've been traveling, Shannon, for like, and I know it hasn't always been easy. I can't imagine for like 10 years now. I think actually you settled down this year for a minute. (laughs) (laughs) For a minute. So I actually, I went through the whole process. I'm legally in Europe for a year, which for Americans, you have to apply for a visa if you want to stay longer than three months. And I decided last summer I was in Barcelona after having walked 500 miles across Spain on the Camino de Santiago. It was a long journey. That is a long journey. (laughs) And I decided to move here. And I, you know, I'm not sure it's my forever home, but I've already, you know, left here four times in the last three months to go to other places. But it is a home base where I have a bed and a drawer filled with clothes that don't have to fit into one 40 liter suitcase. <laughs> is that what's that feel like? Is that do you get slightly how do I say this? I don't want to say panic, but does it yeah, I will say panic when you thought about rooting down or having a home base or was it something that organically uh came to fruition where okay, this is time to have a little bit of a base. Yeah, it was it was absolutely both of those. Like I had been growing weary for a while looking for looking for utopia as we right. I was like, oh, like Goldilocks. I was like, this one doesn't fit. And I was in Mexico and I, you know, had been in Thailand and I was like, I want the perfect place. And it was when I was in Barcelona. It does a disservice of, for, of me to say this about the city, but I was like, this is good enough. Because like any place, Spain has its problems. Yeah. But Barcelona had the water, it has great weather, the food, the culture. I speak Spanish. And so it was good enough. And I felt really good about like ending the 10 years. But then my real estate agent, when I was signing for this place, so he was the real estate agent for the owner, the landlord. And when I was handing over the money, and it's a big fee, you have to have like basically four months rent that you hand over all at once. Wow. And yeah, so that was a big chunk. I was like, this is not only my name on a lease, but like, here's a lot of cash saying that I'm doing this. Right. And so I started going, I put my hand on the money as I pass it over the desk. And I was like, hold on, do you think this is a good idea? And he's like, why are you asking me this? <laughs> oh my God, there was like that moment of like, we pull it back or it's, there's, it's almost over the line. You're like, oh. <laughs> And yeah, and I, so I did it and now I'm really good with the decision. But there was absolutely that panic. I was like, once I do this, that's a really big decision for the next year of my life. So, yeah. what, do you, what do you think about, I mean, I just, I, I think about, it's been a decade, right, Shannon? So you've been, you 2008, you know, you get on that plane. I think you went to Australia. I can't even imagine all of the ups and downs and love and, you know, pain and, you know, all the, everything, all the memories. I mean, how are you feeling when you, when you look back, just even over the past couple of years about quote unquote travel and everything you've done and seen is probably more than like a whole 10 people, 10 lifetimes for some people. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. It's the travel aspect of it. it you know, I, I never want to sound snobbish, right? But it was my life. So when I look back at the 10 years, I sort of, I frame things uniquely, right? Where I was like, oh, like this was the year that I did, you know, where I was, in these five countries. And so like, I can frame all of my memories based on like what happened where, but then life happened during all of that, where sometimes family members got sick and I had to go back and there were weddings that I either traveled back for or missed. And so like, just like everybody, I had to live life on the road. And so I have these incredible travel memories alongside all of that, but they are under, under the, you know, sort of the baseline, because I was living on the road, there's a lot of memories where it's like, this was what it was like to have depression by myself in Cambodia. Right, right. Because you're still Which going through emotional. Everybody's right. going through emotional just because one's in another country or in another, you know, seem must feel like a planet sometimes. But because you're in another location, you still go through things, mm-hmm. quote unquote, you know, like physical illnesses, mental, you know, spiritual, all those things. Absolutely. And so the past 10 years have been beautiful. And from the travel perspective, right, I have these stories that um, I feel incredibly grateful to have had, but it was not a perpetual vacation. Like I have lived 10 years of all of these sort of, like you said, the emotional, the spiritual, everything that happens to oneself in 10 years has happened. It's just with a beautiful background of stories of food and culture and people and and all of that sort of thing. Yeah. Awesome. So uh, with a couple of topics that I had a really, you know, I could go, you have so much rich 
intel and experience, it took a little bit of time for me to focus and just try to nail down a couple topics for us. So one of them is I want to talk a little bit about connecting to cultures through food. And the other one, obviously, is the supporting social enterprises and how dig into some food-driven ways and how that's executed, you know, which is kind of umbrellas under responsible tourism, which we mentioned in the beginning. So, you know, I love food. I'm like all about food, everything. It's like for it's I don't know if it's my Jewish background, but it's like it's it's love, it's happiness, it's survival, it's curiosity, it's I mean, it's exploration. There's all of those things. And I find, and you know mentioned it on your blog, you know, kind of food as a portal into culture. Mm-hmm. So what's what's just your grand thought about that, about food and portal into culture? So, you know, I, I tell people that you don't have to pick a, one single lens, right? But to your travel, you can be curious about art and you can be curious about all kinds of things. But when you pick something like food, it is, it is something that you use to kind of like insert yourself. Like you create a wedge into that culture where you're like prying apart what you might not see if you were sort of exploring history and art and food and everything. When you choose food, when I choose food on the road, what I try to do is I go, I'm going to use this to pry back and learn what I can. And so you'll learn about the history, the architecture, the sort of like the older history, all of that, because that all comes down through food. And so one of my favorite lenses is food because the food cuisine has been shaped by the past of who conquered that country and which countries colonized it. And so you'll see all of these fascinating influences from that perspective. And then you've also got the social component of it. Food shows how they organize their familiar structures, how they operate differently sometimes than the US. Like you'll have nuclear families who makes the food. And so there's all of these processes. And I feel like, although there's all these different lenses that you can have, volunteering being one I talk about, right? But food takes all of them together. It's absolutely phenomenal because you know, everybody eats, it sounds cliche, but everyone eats. And so these cultures have honed their own traditions over over centuries. And you can access all these different nuances of their culture if you're curious and, you know, interested. Oh, I love I loved just what you're saying. I, I got this visual of like, you know, prying back, you know, that pry back and kind of digging into. I want to kind of get some examples or some insights of something when we were talking, when you were just speaking, was there a flash of a country or a food or a culture that came to mind? like off the top, I'm, I mean, I know you have so much experiences with so many, um, but, but anything that just yeah. pops, like I mean, I could say, you know, is it the Chinese, French, or maybe a village, or maybe kind of dig in a little bit to the next layer on that? Mm-hmm. So in Oaxaca, I lived in Oaxaca for about five and a half months. And Oaxaca is in Mexico, sort of in the South. The Oaxaca state goes toward Guatemala, sort of that. That's sort of the region that we're talking about. And when you, when people talk about Oaxaca, spelled O A X A C A, so some people may have read this. And if you haven't heard anyone say it, you're like, whoa, what is that? (laughs) But um, so Oaxaca is the center of food culture for Mexico. A lot of the most famous dishes came from there and it's where a lot of the history stays. And so the fusion sort of scene in Mexico is happening right now in Oaxaca where they're playing with their culinary traditions. And they call it the land of the seven mullahs. You know, lots of people have different origin stories, but anyways, that's where they all originated. And they also have these indigenous cultures. And so I was really lucky. I was fortunate to be volunteering for a microfinance organization that took me out into the villages where I was working with indigenous communities to photograph them for marketing materials and that sort of thing for the microfinance organization. And so I was in these this village, this one village called San Miguel, San Miguel de Allende. And then so far, it takes an hour and a half to get there. Tourists rarely go there. And so when I was there, it, I was able to see how, you know, I was talking about all the different aspects of it. And so Spanish culture, especially in Oaxaca, they've got these different aspects that you can sort of read through history. So there's the importance of chocolate to the world and they love chocolate. And so they've got these different, they drink it for breakfast. They have these different dishes that they have and they mix it with corn, which is another really important piece of their cultural heritage is the different ways that Mexican have corn. And so when you go into the indigenous communities, especially, you see that it's not just one part of their day, like these sort of elements that we think of for Mexican cuisine. Um, in the indigenous communities especially, are the bedrock of their lives. Like they are having them every day. They form traditions around them. And I was participating in a 
I was there one day when there were two weddings and two baptisms. And so there were four separate parties around this tiny village. And all of them had these traditional food elements where people were inviting me in and giving me these handmade you know, tortillas and everything and all of these dishes. And it was an incredible way to sort of see that everything that's been passed down through the centuries is still really alive and they actually use them every single day. Wow. I mean, that's so cool. I was just visualizing for a sec. So the, when I think of the, like, even to dig into the in, individuals, like the chocolate, I mean, even harvesting it, growing it, or that process before you even get to, you know, has culture, has, has a story. Same with the corn. Mm-hmm. And that's the thing. So when you, when you do your own research, right? Like I'm big on, I'm really big on travelers knowing a baseline, right? Like the locals aren't always going to have the whole backstory on where this came through, came from and how it came down through history. But when you have those that backstory, when you go online and you research and you read some things before you enter a new culture, it gives you the context to sort of say, you know, you know, was chocolate something that was brought in in the last 50 years or 300 years ago? So then you can say like, did you have family members? You can start asking questions that open up context that really all of this is just a way. So, you know, the toast was to curiosity. And so all of this, like, going into the village and learning about their food and asking and, you know, eating with them is so that you have a reason to ask questions and to be there and say, like, tell me about it. Did your family grow corn? And often the answer is absolutely. My grandma lives one town over and she's still like, you know, got her blue corn tortilla. She's got her blue corn field there and that's the blue corn tortillas you're eating. And I'm like, yes. (laughs) Do you feel as though in these indigenous areas and where I would say the land still has some more uh, preservation to it without maybe some chemicals or other human-made errors in, in erosion of the land and all that. I don't want to get into it, but could you taste, do you feel as though that's still, that's, that area is still protected in Waka or in as the, like the corn and the, the cacao or the chocolate, whatever they're growing, is that still intact? And is that still held sacred? You know, it's changing because the, right, we're not going to get like super political here, but because right. we subsidized <laughs> corn here in the US, like their relationship with corn is changing. They still have all these indigenous varieties and let's hope that more of our corn does not blow across the border. But even beyond that, it is cheaper to import corn from America because of the subsidies. And so you do see that by and large, like they make their saludas, which are these large flat it's like a Mexican pancake, what they call it there, but it's 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 this really large specialty, which is a corn with the lime, and it's all traditionally prepared. And they would never use American corn for that. But then, in some other ways, like some of their their dishes, it is cheaper to buy corn, and it is cheaper to use that absolutely in the manufacturing of all the sweets and sort of stuff like that. So their relationship has changed with outside countries. And so I think that has shifted some of their relationship with corn, but you do see that these recipes are made the same way. Like I saw people grinding the exact same way they have for a century. They still had the um, mocha hete, like the, the stone grinders that they can use. Oh, that's cool. And then they pass down the, the recipes and, and the process. It's so, I love that. It's just so, I mean, I don't know. what Did you, Shannon, when you were growing up, what was it like at, a, at your dinner table? Was there any ritualistic uh, kind of family gatherings? Oh, um, that's really funny. No. So it was through travel that I discovered maybe more of a passion for food. My mother, love her, but she was a terrible cook. Um, <laughs> really terrible. <laughs> Let me tell you that one of the... I've never, so we were also very poor, really, really quite poor. And I have four older brothers. And so the five of us kids were a lot to feed. And my mom's specialty once a week was like, nobody, everybody wanted to ask if they could eat at their friend's house on Friday because it was, wait for it, garbage soup night, which was <laughs> everything in the fridge. Right. <laughs> so Friday nights were like... See ya. <laughs> right? It's like, oh man, can you imagine? I've got another sleepover. That's <laughs> so funny. So you have four brothers. You have, you have four brothers. So there's five mm-hmm. and you're the only female. So yeah, that is expensive. I, I was thinking about when you're raising males versus females and you have a, quite a few. That's that's a, it's a, because it's just calorically they eat men eat more. <laughs> Boys growing, <laughs> right? Do. I mean, it's just, it's just the fact. <laughs> they can annihilate a refrigerator. <laughs> like just, like, right? I mean, it's crazy. That's so funny. So, no, our food rituals, though, one of my favorite, this is completely ridiculous, but um, no, the food rituals were less about actually like eating up the food and more for me was protecting my food. And so I remember the, this is, 
when I tell people, they're like, that's absolutely absurd. But again, four boys, like you said, they eat everything. So I remember if you put like a frozen pizza or something in the oven, you had to go around and like visibly lick the frozen pizza in front of each person. <laughs> <laughs> no, I get it. To claim it. Is that like you're, you have to claim the pizza? I mean, you had to. That's so funny. You're about protection. I mean, that's your ritual, right? So you like, I mean, that's, that's amazing. <laughs> that's funny. I was licking my food. I did it in front of me, though. I did it in front of another, like, my best friend is another travel writer. And I remember one day, just like, it was this instinct, like, it was like a piece of cake or something. And I was eating dinner. And then she sat down and she was like, that looks really good. And I picked it up and licked it and put it back. She was like, I don't know what just happened. Oh my god, that's so funny, <laughs> that's so funny Shannon. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, that's really funny. So, yeah, I mean, that's like that's a, a cultural, um, r- you know, ritual they probably <laughs> could be passing down. <laughs> oh my god, that's awesome. What about the impact of cook- cooking traditional food really preserves the culture? And you know, immigrants is an interesting topic right now. And how does that translate? Like from your travels, you're in, say, you know, you're in Thailand. And then now when you eat Thai food in the States or the Thai community, what's, how does that differ? Or is there threads of similarity? What I've really realized though, is, you know, I can get some of the flavors and the fun of the dishes when I'm at an ethnic restaurant in another country, but there is nothing to compare with eating You know, so Masaman curry is one of my favorite. And like sitting at a street stall on those tiny chairs. If you've never been to Southeast Asia, they have these tables with these like little tiny stools that large Westerners, you just feel like. (laughs) I haven't been there yet. So 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 they're like um, food stalls. Maybe you have to paint the picture a little bit. So um, it would be this. um, I I know I saw it on, I think it was on Anthony Bourdain. He was, he was, um, which and one of his shows. So it's like these food, I don't want to say courts, but there actually are stalls, right? Where you order your food and then you sit, is it a community table or are you right in front of, in the stall? It's a little bit of both. And so it depends on where you're at, like which country. So in Thailand, if it's even which market you're at, there'll often be one vendor will have a few tables and a few tiny stools that you can sit on and eat there. And then there'll be like a larger setup that someone will have um, nearby where you could also go there. And so you'll eat communally, but because everything is so compact and so tight and because the street food culture is for everyone to be outside, you know, my favorite vendor, I lived in Chiang Mai for on and off for about a year and it was a, I'm a vegetarian. So I was at a vegetarian restaurant and I would sit there and these locals would come up while I'm, you know, eating my, my meal, they would ride up on their motorbike and it was like they had a standing order. So it'd just be like handed over money exchanged. And then they like zoom away without ever getting off their bike. Wow. And so that's sort of the element that um, I find really interesting. It's, it's one of the things about Thai culture, where if you are at a restaurant in the U S that's never happened unless, and I want to know where, if, if somebody hears this, it's like, no, there's a place you can go, right. <laughs> but it changes the eating experience. It changes the entire experience of how you experience Thai food because Thai food is social. And a lot of them, although they have meals and family meals, absolutely that aren't lived outside. Part of Thai culture is to eat out in the open and have these street foods and these snacks that are lived outdoors that we don't really have in the United States. And so some of these cultures, it's very distant when you you get the flavors, you get some of that beauty, but you are completely apart from the experience that you would have if you would actually been diving into the food culture in the country. That's interesting. I didn't know that. That's that's a cool little glimpse. What about flavor profiles? I mean, obviously sourcing in other countries or from Thailand versus here, I mean, the, you can't really compare some of the ingredients. However, the dishes. So again, with Thailand, like I would say that in... And when I go to a Thai restaurant, if I ask for the spicy vinegar, so they've got like four condiments usually on every Thailand and on every table in Thailand. It's um, some chili that you can scoop out and then it's soy sauce with peppers, hot peppers in it and then vinegar and then table sugar, which the Thai people love to put table sugar, like ground sugar on their food. <laughs> so it's like these four though things along with like a lot that might come out are the elements of Thai cuisine, hot, sour, spicy, and sweet, I think are the yeah. four. And they don't always 
they actually rarely do that in the United States. Right? You get served a dish, maybe they'll have the lime on the side, but the way that you doctor the food, which I only learned to do by just sitting there at, at that tiny table watching other people. And I was like, okay, so we seem to favor like three scoops of the white one scoop of that. You know yeah, I mean? right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. My friend's from Thailand and she, she, she's a saucer. She's got, she puts, and now I understand it was like so much sugar, so much chili, so much soy. I mean, but she has this perfect, I mean, it's like a whole ritual when she's, when she doctors up a dish. It's really interesting to watch. It is. And you don't learn it. I mean, maybe you could, maybe you could like ask the owner, like, I would like you to show me how to doctor this dish like I was in Thailand, right? Like that would be the curious way to do it in the United States. But it was something different for, I, w- I was 24 the first time I landed in 10, 25. And so that me, so that Shannon was like, um, I want to fit in. I know I don't fit in, but I want to fit in. So I'm just going to start scooping everything everyone else does. <laughs> and then what did you, what happened after that? Did you feel like you kind of got, got the rhythm of it? Or how- Absolutely. Well, and then I would take cooking classes. I'm really big. We're going to talk about social enterprises soon, I know, but I'm really big on paying for the right to access the information you want if, if it's not accessible. So in most of these places I travel, English is not the native language. I can't expect the vendor, um, you know, the street food vendor who is charging me 75 cents for this dish to speak fluent English and explain the food history to me. But when I take a cooking class, Um, usually at a social enterprise, if I can find them, it's there that like after I learned to sort of doctor my food in these certain ways, or once you're sort of embedded, you have the right questions to ask. You can say, okay, I see these things happening and now I need to find somebody and ask them and have them like explain some of these things to me. And so over the course of the year, that I lived in Thailand, I would have these opportunities. I would maybe meet another Thai person and find these cool opportunities to ask them a question and learn more about why they have these flavor profiles and like when is when is so fried rice, right? They're like, that's only a breakfast food. That's sort of the leftovers from the night before. They're like, are you Americans eating that for dinner? <laughs> I, know. I was going to ask you like the different components of like the, with the meals and how it might be different or what's that's so interesting. So fried rice, what are the, what other standouts? for snacks or meals? Well, so there's a dish called Yum Pai Dao. And it's one of those that you can order anywhere as a vegetarian. And it's maybe not even on the menu, but the ingredients are so simple. It's um, tamarind and sometimes fish sauce. I'm a flexitarian and we can talk about that. Like I'm really big on um, not pushing my agenda on other people. So sometimes I let things slide, but, um, and then it's like fried eggs and tomato. And and so they're all mixed together. And it's also a local dish. And because it's often not on the menu, but it is one I really enjoy. um, It's one I've never really seen at a US restaurant. But when you order it in Thailand, it comes out 100%. No matter how many times you say that you don't want it spicy, it comes out, (laughs) I'm spicy. (laughs) Sometimes you wonder why there are certain foods in certain regions. So is, I always wonder with the spice, is it because that's what people grow up on because that's what's grown or is there a reason for it with the heat or is it that people's bodies, maybe their blood type with anti-inflammatory? I mean, that's, we're going really deep, but I always am curious about that. I don't know if you have any insight. I have anecdotes, right? Like in, in India, they said the reason why they eat the really hot beverages, right? Like they drink super hot chai throughout the day, even though it's sometimes 100 degrees and 95% humidity. You're like, why are we drinking <laughs> ever? <laughs> it's because it, it like forces your body to cool. So as long as you're not overheated already, you it activates the cooling systems in your body. And so I'm not really sure with the chili peppers, but I do know that even... Even if there's no biological reason, they always have something. I've never asked that question, but they always have an answer. And it's always really fun to ask. Yeah, right. And and the different, and now there's the other things too with the uh, Chinese food and Thai food. There's always the balance, you know, there's always like, so maybe the, it's the hot, the, you know, the, the spicy, sweet, savory, salty. So maybe it's just hitting those points on the tongue. I don't, I don't know, but it's just always interesting to me because I wonder about that. Cause I knew that in the middle East, at least in, I've been to Israel. I remember like, again, they're drinking hot coffee all day. And I'm like, it was so forking mm-hmm. hot. And I'm like, why are we drinking this hot? I want something cold, <laughs> you know? And they're yeah. like, they said something along the lines of, you know, so get your body's temperature to match, <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it cools faster. And I'm like, well, that's not how we do it. We, we drink, use ice, <laughs> you know, it's so funny. We talked about Thailand. What about um, other other parts of the world that you kind of spent a little bit of time? And I know it was a waka. 
And I know in um, Thailand, where else? And, and then let's walk, move into uh, supporting social enterprises and some for-profit businesses. But I want to know another maybe spot you've been to that kind of pops for you. Well, India is, as a vegetarian traveler, right? Like I don't always have some of those like super fun stories that some travelers have because there is a, there is a part of my travel experience that I acknowledge is missing from not being able to share in certain meals. And, and in India though, it's an entire cuisine. So instead of like going to a restaurant and ordering like the two things that have been adapted to be vegetarian. So they were like usually a dish that is served with meat that the locals just like substitute. So in India though, it's an entire cuisine, North to South, different regional flavors, everything that is designed to taste amazing vegetarian. And for me, that was an absolute revelation. My family ate Thai food growing up when we did go out, when, when it was not garbage soup night and we, it was like a birthday or something, we would also go for Thai food. So I had this like basic understanding, right? It wasn't the Thai food of like the cultural Thai food with the, with the street food and the really interesting elements of it, but I was familiar. So I was not familiar with Indian food before really arriving in India. And it was one of the best experiences of my life. I was there for, I was in South Asia for four months, two months in India, two months in Nepal. And I don't think I've ever eaten better. It was amazing. nice. So I know because on, on your website, you have, you do a, a blog about ve- tra- vegan travel uh, or how to travel as a vegetarian. Mm-hmm. Um, so you must have obviously, I, I didn't dig into that section of it. I didn't have enough time, but, um, you must have, uh, that must've been an organic, organic, um, part that just kind of happened. Cause you're like, wait a minute, this is, it's not the easiest, right? I mean, to travel as a vegetarian, I mean, now maybe mm, no, but eight, 10 years ago, still. Still. And yeah, it's absolutely challenging. The most challenging thing is, is that tourist restaurants, Right. In 10 years, there are areas that have become more touristy. And so, they, yes, they understand things like vegetarianism and celiac. But there are still cultural, even in these more touristy areas, there are still cultural elements. And this is something that I'm not going to get in, I'm not going to get into like fighting words of any vegans who might be listening. <laughs> but one of my problems with traveling vegans over the years the more militant ones have that they have been that like one of my guiding principles is respect, right? In every way, respect. And I also believe that eating vegetarian is a privilege and it's something that because I have money, I am able to do. And in a lot of the world, protein in any way that you can find it is survival, right? They, there are poor areas where rice patty rat is on the menu because that's where they get their protein from. And that's why in China, they sometimes eat these different insects that we find that maybe not as appealing. Agreed. And so, and so for me, like traveling as a vegetarian, I call myself a flexitarian because I've never actually like ordered meat in, in 20 years. I've been vegetarian for 20 years. There were only been like four or five times on the road where I have chosen to eat meat. And it's because in a cultural context, it was served to me in a way that would be really deeply offensive. And I'm, I do believe that you can ethically eat meat. I I was 14 and I saw a documentary on mad cow disease. It was like 1998 and they, were, they released PBS. Nova had a documentary. And so I really hated our practices. But now as an adult, I see that there are people who treat their animals really well and who have a much different relationship with food. And so anyway, that's like a long... No, that was of, really good. I was, I was really... <laughs> I, I really appreciated that that perspective because I... I that's, that's a great perspective, especially from, you know, somebody who's been traveling, also you're a vegetarian. When I was, just to add on to that, to support that, when I was in Italy and I was living on the farm, right? And I was like, you know, I, anytime, whatever, because they're on the farm, you know, they're farmers, they're out there, you know, catching the chicken and, you know, mm-hmm. plucking it. And I'm, it's out of respect. I was going to, whatever they put down, I'm going to eat and I'm going to eat it all. <laughs> you know, because <Yeah. laughs> I, like, I respect the food, I respect them and food is you know, important and, you know, sacred because it's, it's, um, there's only so much of it when, where I was. Mm -hmm. And I remember I was sitting there and I was like, oh God, what is this? You know, I think to myself, I don't know what that is. And everyone's speaking Italian and mine was, I was still learning Italian and I understand a little Spanish. So I was trying, and I was like, pigeon. I was like, but I was thinking of like a pigeon, you know, American, you know, from the States, pigeon, (laughs) but there there was a different type of pigeon. Still, it was interesting. I, you know, had the little legs, sorry to be the script, but it was like, (laughs) what was I going to do? You know, I had to eat it. It was something that I knew, I knew going there that I was going to, you know, respect the culture, respect, and I was going to probably be presented at situations that might be uncomfortable, 
Mm-hmm. And what does one do? And I, 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 I agree with that respect for the culture. Um, maybe others might disagree, but for me, I agree. Oh, it's, yeah. And that's my thing is, if you, my whole like purpose, part, one of my underlying purposes, right, was to understand these other cultures. And I found it, I found myself unwilling to stand by this militantly, like I want to be vegetarian in the face of really like compelling human reasons why they like want to serve me this. And often I was, I'm a guest of honor. So especially after in the last, like the later years of my travel, sometimes when I'm visiting social enterprises, they'll Google me and they'll think I'm cooler than I am. But you are (laughs) really cool, Shannon. (laughs) (laughs) You are. But there was this one time I was visiting a social enterprise in Laos and it was, it was a weaving collective. And the first part was just weaving at a local shop. And I had said like, hey, I'm vegetarian. I'm, I'm really upfront. I'm really proactive, right? I've learned like, you say that even if they're not saying they're going to feed you, you tell them I'm a vegetarian. <laughs> and for some reason, like the message didn't get passed on. We were in this rural community um, of the weavers. They took my niece. My niece was 11 at the time and she was traveling with me. And they prepared us for lunch. We were not supposed to eat lunch with them, but this small community thought I was an honored guest and like had prepared river fish, this beautiful river fish with like a really expensive preparation of like tomato sauce on top. And my niece, you know, at 11, picky eater, she was, she doesn't eat fish. And so she's looking at me and she was like, what are we going to do? And I scooped some onto her plate and I scooped some onto mine. And at this point I had not had fish in 15 years. Oh my gosh. And um, I look at her and I was like, oh, this is the best fish I've had in a decade. (laughs) (laughs) And my niece is like, oh man, because she has never seen me eat meat and starts eating it. (laughs) That's funny. So you kind of made it. Yeah. It's because I understood in that situation, like my ethics, my morals, whatever, don't trump the the gesture, sort of this this cultural moment that these people were trying to have with me, that it would be deeply offensive and also something that to their dying day, they may never understand why I didn't eat this thing they had prepared for me because culturally it would make no sense. And so in that moment, I sort of tried to weigh like my purpose here on a human being as a human on earth is to do no harm and to travel with respect. And this would be deeply res- disrespectful. All right, that's well said. And I that will definitely bring us over into the supporting social enterprises part of what I wanted to talk to you about. But I just have to tell you something funny. So, um, you know, I grew up in a very Jewish environment, Shannon. So um, in Boston, my mom's like, she, my parents are still alive and they're together and they're still like, oh, Deborah, like very Jewish, right? <laughs> so like, I remember I had a friend over, it was like, not like a, for, you know, Friday night dinner. It was just a regular dinner or something, but there was like some traditional Jewish, you know, briskets and the kugel and something along those lines. And my friend didn't really eat. She ate some of one of the dish. And my mom was like, what's the matter? You don't like it? What? You don't like it? Like, it was like, because she only had a little bit of it, of the kugel or something. And it was just really funny. If my mom was like, kept thinking about it. She's like, what? She doesn't like kugel? How can you not like Kugel? <laughs> she just doesn't understand, right? It's so funny though, but it was just how just even in this micro environment growing up, my mom just so culturally and, and traditionally focused on food that notes it, you know, notices it. And to this day, she probably could tell you exactly what all my friends have eaten and what they don't, you know, she thinks about it. So just, that's what made me uh, think about that story when you were saying that in a Oh no, that's amazing. She does. I'm at, she's absolutely, she's got her list. There's probably a shit list on there. There's like, oh, she didn't like my dish that she didn't like that dish. The bad friend of hers, Amy, Amy's out. <laughs> totally. How can you not like the Kugel? Who doesn't like Kugel? <laughs> <laughs> so funny. Okay. So let's, let's move on to something that is so in alignment for you. Um, and that's the social enterprise aspect of tourism and you know, responsible tourism. So let's, let's define a little bit about supporting like social enterprises and quote, for-profit businesses abroad. What does that kind of mean? So social enterprises are businesses. They can be, they're often for-profit, but they give a large portion of their money to a social mission or like baked right into the core. So it's not just a for-profit or a non-profit, but because some some nonprofits don't even have such the strong mission that we're looking for. So for a social enterprise, what you want is baked into the core of supporting them will support some sort of social issue. And I go even further to say that I really try, my database tries to find ones that are locally founded. So it's something that a local decided was a social issue in their own country or community, and they decided to address it. And so examples of this would be 
Um, there are a lot of street children. And so there are all there are a lot around the world of training restaurants in developing countries for taking kids off the street and giving them vocational training school skills in tourism as waiters or chefs or that sort of thing. And so when you go to these training restaurants, you are funding these initiatives. You're eating a great dinner and you're funding these initiatives to get street kids off the streets. And then that's like one side of it, but then it can also look like there's this spa in Thailand called Lila, Thai Massage, and they don't even advertise. They, somebody needs to tell them that they should be doing better about their social media <laughs> because I did not even know at first. But what they do is they are run, all of the women who give you your massage and your pedicures and your facials are former prisoners. And so in Thai society, they're not able to ever reintegrate. There's like a much bigger stigma. We have got our own stigma, right? Let's not even talk about the prison system in America. But in Thai society, especially the women are not welcomed really back into society. So they get this vocational training and you get a really great massage, let me tell you. Oh my gosh. And it's called Lila? What was that one called? You said? Yeah, Lila Thai Massage in Chiang Mai. They have um, a couple of locations. And so these are examples of businesses that are just by nature of supporting them, you are making sure that your money not only stays in the community. So when you eat at a mom and pop restaurant that doesn't have a social mission, you're still doing great because they're feeding their kids and they're paying school fees and it's all staying in the environment, which is different than if you eat at the Hilton Hotel restaurant where most of that money is going back to Hilton headquarters and like 90, up to 95% of money from multinational corporations when you stay at these types of hotels or you know, take these types of tours, 95% leaves the country. So you're there traveling in Thailand on a, I'm not going to name and shave, but on any big name tour. And most of your money is actually going right back out of the country. So Shannon, when um, you say that, that's interesting. That's like, I love this whole topic that you're talking about. Like I have chills, I'm grinning. I'm not about that part, but I mean, just that we're talking about it and that there, I just love it. So just so people are clear, when you mean a larger tour, like an example would be something that I, how, how, because some people just don't know, you know, what maybe you're referring to or, or what's going on. So do you mean like a, a tour group that you book here? I don't know what some examples would be or something, but is that like, can you, can you give a, some description on what it is that you're referring to without maybe naming the groups? Yeah, well, so any, any tour that is a US-based company so there are, let me talk about ones that are that are responsible, like okay, Intrepid Travel and G Adventures. <laughs> Intrepid Travel and G Adventures are two tour companies that are not based in the developing world. They run tours all over the world. G Adventures is based out of Canada and they have an underlying social mission. But a lot of the but they are a for-profit company. And so although they're doing really great and they have this sub-organization called Planetera that finds projects so that on every tour and every location, their travelers are leaving some money behind in a project that Planetera has helped do ventures find. So this is an example of a tour company that's still taking a lot of profits and those profits that you're paying. Let's say you pay $3,000 for a G Adventures tour. Some of that is staying in Canada with G Adventures headquarters, right? To pay the staff, to pay the marketing. But when you travel independently and you hire a local tour guide, that local tour guide is not a multinational corporation. He is based out of Thailand and he's going to take you on a motorbike tour of the temples and all of the money stays in Thailand, a hundred percent of it. Okay. I just wanted to make sure we're all on the same page there. Cool. So you're, you're talking a little bit more about social enterprise, for-profit business. And first of all, I love the idea of like, the, you know, anything with restaurants, like I think that's so cool, like taking the kids off the street and, and giving them the the um, skill set to, you know, front of the house or back of the house, just to kind of be able to be a participant in, in life and feel good about themselves. And I think restaurants are one of the best ways because now we can, as, as guests can come in and then it's just, it's just a win-win, you know, it's an easy way to support. And it's also a clear cut. So with volunteering, there's some deep issues, right? We're not going to get into those, but there's deep fundamental issues about dependency and if volunteering, if you're, you know, trying to save them, then are you creating dependency? They're like, let's not go down that road. But to say that the alternative is you have a really direct relationship. Your job is not to get that street child off the streets, right? You're not like going out there trying to, you know, not as a social worker come in from America and like talk to street kids and convince them to do better. Right. You have a really clear, you have a clear relationship. You're there to eat food and 
often too, like the great thing about these training restaurants is that they also are really great places to ask questions and they're, they're almost always preparing traditional dishes. So it's a really wonderful way to experience the culture. And these street kids are often eager or sometimes they're single moms. I've seen some training restaurants that are for single moms who have no other vocational skills and they'll be trained, but whatever it is, is right. Like you've got this clear relationship. You have, you know what your part in this is. Your part is pay for my meal so that this person can keep learning how to be a chef, a waiter, whatever. I love that. And just, that's just make, doesn't it just make sense? When you think it just it? makes sense. Right? <laughs> I mean, it really does. So we, um, the other part was be, being pot, conscious of your purchasing habits. I know you talk a lot about your the free, your fair trade coffee journey, the effect of the chocolates, you know, with the in Panama. We talked a little bit of mi- microfinance, but what about the purchasing habits? And what we've talked a little bit about that with the restaurants just now, but maybe on a, in another arena as well. Yeah, so purchasing habits it's we've got these buzzwords and even now right there's buzzwords that i i don't really have a connection to but so to take it broader right when i talk about like farming connection with the world like because i have been to kenya forever when i see a news story about kenya i have a connection to it i feel a relationship with kenya in a way that humanizes it and makes it less other so in psychological terms right like i am now more invested in what happens to kenya slash all of the other 60 plus countries i visited i have a story of their world i have a story of the world that contextualizes these countries and makes me care and so for food for, you, for words like fair trade, for when we're trying to get people to care about the people on the other side, and it's really far removed from them. This fair, tra- I took a fair trade journey in Chiang Mai, Thailand. And the guy who sort of like the face of it all is Lee, and he was an indigenous Aka villager who lived in this small community up in the mountains in northern Thailand. And he ended up going to school. He was the first one. His village sent him away to learn. And he came up with a way. He said, like, I've seen the buzz. It was was really like, the West likes this word fair trade. We need money because the Thai government now insists that we pay school fees. And they used to have a much different system in the indigenous villages. He was like, so we're going to institute this. And so this chocolate journey or this, um, sorry, coffee journey I went on would take It was just one small part of his business. His business is a coffee shop that roasts the beans his community creates. And what I was able to see is the whole process of what it actually meant to be fair trade. So I met Lee first in 2011, and he was in his first year. He did not have fair trade certification and everything that it took. Then I went and met his mother, and I went on two different journeys. And by the end, I was willing to pay when I met the store here in Barcelona and there's a piece of chocolate that says fair trade. And then there's a piece of chocolate that I've got all these other stories about. I now understand that there's someone on the other side who actually does have a better quality of life and how good that is depends on the company and all these other things, but it makes a difference. And so when you travel, you have this opportunity to find out the source of everything food related that we talk about and connect the story of the world that makes you care more and like be willing to maybe pay a little bit more to make sure that the other person on the other side can send their kid to school. That's so true, Shannon. That's a great, I know, I know a little bit more about that story, that I, it's, which we can find on your website and I, I think you on your blog. Yes. Um, it's a great story. Mm-hmm. It's a great, excellent story. And Lee, oh, I'm curious. So I, there's so many parts to that, but first of all, how did you, I don't want to say stumbling, but how did you find Lee's coffee shop? That was in 2011. And and to me, you must have had some curiosity. So you started talking to him and next thing you know, your journey takes you, you know, up into this three and a half, was it three and a half, you know, hours (laughs) up into the mountains to to the family. And then you saw the whole co-op and how it's run. And then even more curiosity, figure out you know, about fair trade and really what that means. So A, how did you find Lee's coffee shop? And B, do you want to define fair trade for people that, and is there, is there a not, is there something sketchy about fair trade that we may not know of? Or is fair trade certification legitimate no matter what? Yeah. So I found Lee through other expats in Chiang Mai. Um, they had been living there before I arrived and knowing sort of my social, my bent on responsible tourism, they were like, oh, this is this great charismatic young guy who's trying to create change for his community up on the mountainside. And so that was really it. I'm a deep lover of coffee. So it's, it's not very hard to convince me to go to a new coffee shop. <laughs> <laughs> um, and 
Yeah, so that's sort of how it started. And he was not far from the apartment that I was that I had rented in Chiang Mai. His coffee shop wasn't. And it was over the course. He spoke great English, which again um, is one of those things. So because I was paying for a coffee and he was often there making my coffee, I started asking questions, started getting curious. I was like, I want to know more about why you're doing this and who are the people on the other side. You're telling me that I should feel good about buying this cup of coffee. And why is that? And so Lee and I became much deeper friends um, over the course of a couple of years. But the heart of it was like, he had just started and he had this vision for what it was going to be. And then I watched him struggle to get the fair trade certification and organic certification and all of these labels that we put on things in the West to protect what you're asking about, which is the integrity of the label. Thank you. The integrity. Yes. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And the answer is, is like, it, it really... Yes, the label means something and they try to be very, really rigorous. But if you have not traveled and seen just how far um, bribery gets you, then you don't understand how much there's also a lot of wiggle room in where that goes. Right. And so I, I pay for fair trade because I believe that there is a large percentage of the time where it increases the quality of life on the other side for the people. So fair trade means that the people on the on the very end, the very origin side of whatever you're eating, be it chocolate or coffee, or if it's a fair trade piece of clothing, Victoria's Secret had a big thing and with Burkina Faso sourcing their fair trade cotton. Um, they, had, they had done everything right as a corporation trying to find fair trade cotton to use that they marketed as fair trade cotton. And then there was this whole scandal about child labor, but that's not always the fault of the certification organization. And so this is where it gets into problems where we go, why pay anything? Because there are these like notable scandals where the people on the other side were not protected. But to say that like Lee now tries, he sells his coffee sometimes. He's, he's like trying to export to Europe. When he gets that, and he will because they they are tenacious and they are like they have won international tasting competitions and stuff for their coffee beans. He is committed to growing different trees and plants to flavor the beans differently. So he's going to get there. And when he does, maybe there's another chocolate fair trade chocolate that you see on the sh- or coffee on the shelf that is not going to impact the community. But I can tell you in this circumstance, his community has been changed forever and for the better because they now have a reliable source of income. They can barter together this cooperative for a fair price and they directly take their own beans to market. And they've now controlled the pipeline so they don't have to broker you know, in a bad year. So what happens is, is sometimes with farmers in a bad year, they'll have to broker below the price of actually growing things just because of the season or the people, the middleman. And so fair trade does make a difference. Yes, there are people who are going to point to stories of where it has gone wrong, but on the other side of it are people and the intention is good. And the more money we put behind it, the more protections it will have. Uh Agreed. That's awesome. I love that. So that's awesome about Lee. I feel it's funny. So I, I don't know if it's because I have traveled so that when I read people's stories about their experiences like, you know, in the remote villages, I can connect, I can make the connection quicker or if maybe just, uh, I don't, I don't know. I don't know how that works, but I really felt your connection, maybe it was because you're a prolif- prolific writer. <laughs> I had, up, you. I had <laughs> up my game when I was making my notes for you. <laughs> oh, nice. I, I, um, I just felt really connected with the story with Lee and it might've translated from how you, how you so passionately scribed you know, your, your journey with him, but, um, that's awesome with, with him. Would you ever consider putting together your own like social enterprise, uh, I mean, supporting social enterprise tours? Oh, I have flirted with that idea, but my next, my next project, actually, I'm in the process of writing a book proposal for, it's not going to be called the responsible travelers handbook, but it's, it's basically going to be the, um, how to travel the world, how to, Um, use travel as a force for good. And it's everything we've sort of talked about. It's going to say, like, you don't have to want to volunteer. You just have to be a living, breathing human planning a vacation and you can impact the world in a really remarkable way if you use these tenets of responsible travel to just pick better, pick better companies, pick better restaurants, pick better, you know, tours and hotels and every part of it, you can be having a real impact on these places. And so I hope to have this published. Um, I'll self-publish if not, because I still want to get the message out there. But my next goal is just a book. I love it. I, I'm, I'm excited because I really, I, I feel like this, 
this piece of the travel experience or puzzle or is is not is I think if people knew a little bit more of what you're you're going to be explaining in the book and what we just talked about knew about this then they would support it it's almost like the knowledge isn't there that they that the aha like oh shit I, if I had known that I would have gone to this restaurant or now when I go there I can still feel good about traveling and supporting you know a social enterprise and a for-profit business because it's going to doing quote good and I think that for me I love that that aspect of how we can support and do and do better than trying to like do a negative and say don't support that it's well it's like choosing other things and giving mm-hmm. people the opportunity to choose by by knowledge. And to say, look, you're going to eat. So use that vote. Just like when you go to the grocery store and you pick which brands, right? There are people who, you know, boycott certain brands and certain other instances, like vote for the businesses and these places that are doing the things that align with your values. And it's really not as hard because you're going to be using these services anyways. And one thing I wanted to say too is like this style of travel, I feel like we read all these things about how social media and disconnection and sort of these problems that our hyper-connected world have given us with connecting with other humans. And what I really want to tell people is that this is the secret to transformative travels. Like people go, they go, I want to have a trip. I want to come back different. I want to go for a month to India and come back a different person. And going for a month to India does not make you a different person when you come back. But intentionally trying to have connected transform experience connected experiences those transform you those create the stories it's like when you have a reason to interact and really learn from that culture it's that those experiences where you can't help but be transformed and a lot of those are going to come from food as we talked about like it's just the easiest gateway right i love it ah shannon so <laughs> i i think we went through quite quite a few i, I was i was i'm gonna have to do a part two when your book comes out if you will be <laughs> back on for sure yeah really I always like to to end on a on a recipe. Mm-hmm. Um, do you have a, a food recipe, beverage, or a, me- a recipe for success or life that you would willing to share with us? Yeah, so I mean, it's probably going to be more like a summary of what we talked about, um, but it's sort of a, a recipe for transformative travel. And so this is what everyone tells me they want, right? They look at my travels, they say, "I want, I want to have those really cool experiences." You've got these stories of like, a, like drinking coffee with a granny. How do I have that? And I say, it's really, it's just three steps to have a trip that changes your life, that is just everything you want from it and more. First, you have to find find the way you're going to connect a social enterprise, a food through food. Like, what are you going to connect through? Stay curious, ask questions once you're there. That's step two. Just like actually want to learn from them and don't, you have to be fearless. Some people have some issues there, but like be fearless, ask questions, like really dive in, do your research so that you know what to ask and then find a way to leave the place better. Like, right, support these, leave money behind. That connection by leaving the place better than when you found it will help you feel better about it. Feel better about all of it. It will make you feel better when you go back home that you didn't just go to this place, but you actually had an experience that helped other people. Oh, I love it. I got chill. See, you're so awesome, Shannon. That's amazing. <laughs> that is amazing. And there was one thing I wanted to say before that I meant to bring up before. And it was in, uh, I think it was in your last post of your uh, blog um, mm-hmm. the, about the five things, here are five things you've learned from a life of travel. I think, or maybe it was a while, a little bit before, but the fifth one you wrote was the door opener, like with the smiling. Um, I don't remember. So basically Mm -hmm. I felt like when I was like in, for example, when I was in Italy, I'm sitting there with this very pensive look because I'm trying to understand what the, what the fork they're saying. And they're looking Mm -hmm. at me with these like crazy, like like, crazy glance looks because we're, we're looking at each other, trying to understand each other. And then what I started realizing was like, we could have looked like I could have looked mad to them. Or something, and <laughs> yeah. I, and they looked a little bit like mad at me. So I realized, oh my god, if I just smile, I just relax and smile, and then they smile back, it just changes everything. I know that it seems does. so simple, but it's if you think about it, right? Yes, no, and it's my it's my recipe for diffusing tension too. Like you know, those moments where like, am I being cheated now? You're negotiating anything on the road. Like sometimes these bargaining cultures that we don't quite understand as well. I just go, you know what? I'm gonna take a deep breath and I'm just gonna smile, and I'm gonna like approach them as another human being who look there's some communication problems here but we're both on this like team let's be friends right <laughs> it's so it's so funny because if you're I, I remember thinking like i look alarmed and they look mad and so then they're looking oh, no. more mad because they're thinking i'm alarmed because we're we're trying to think of trying to communicate it's so funny so 
Uh, Shannon, you're awesome. Shannon O'Donnell. And um, thank you so much for joining. This was an awesome, awesome hour to spend I with had you. such fun. I really appreciate you letting me come on. Thanks, Shannon. Thank you so much. Hey, everybody. I hope you enjoyed listening to that episode. And again, please rate and review if you did like this podcast episode or any of the other ones. Please go to iTunes, download, rate, review. I appreciate that very much. Just Forking Around Podcast. And again, I am Debbie Salzberg. My handle on Instagram is at Forking Podcast. My website is just forkingaround.net. And I am so excited to have you on board here with me on the Just Forking Around podcast. And I look forward to seeing you on the next show.